In this lecture video, I wanted to go over a few things in chapter five, the integumentary system, try to help you out a little bit on a few concepts here. Um, first of all, the integumentary system, this is the uh, first of 11 major body systems that we'll go over uh, in this course. And so uh, it tells you briefly here that the integumentary system basically means what's covering the body. That's what the word means. And so that's gonna include, of course, your skin, and then uh, accessory structures, including your hair, glands, and nails. Um, one thing you should do to kind of help you understand the system is to get to know, get familiar with the diagram of the skin, the skin diagram. This is uh, figure 5.1. And so uh, you can refer back to this. It's good to kind of have this open as you go through the video or go through your notes so that you can refer back to the different structures we'll talk about just to kind of orient you to the uh, to the diagram here. A couple of things that you see is uh, the two layers of the skin, the epidermis on the superficial layer, the dermis, which is deep to the epidermis, which is located here. Notice that the dermis has a lot of different structures going on inside of that layer, including the hair follicle that is here. You've got some glands that are here. You have blood vessels, you have nerves, and so you have lots of different things going on in the dermis, whereas the epidermis does not have uh, really any of those types of structures. You also have a layer that we'll talk about briefly called the subcutaneous tissue or the hypodermis, which technically is not part of the skin. The skin really consists of epidermis and dermis. And then you have the hypodermis is what the skin is uh, attaching to at the bottom. So this is a great diagram to kind of refer back to as we go through the notes. And so one of the first things we'll talk about are the functions of the integumentary system. This is kind of a common theme that we'll look at in the different systems is to go through with each of the systems and look at what are some of the major functions of that particular system. And so your textbook goes through several of these. First one there is protection. We'll see this quite a bit throughout the chapter. Um, there's a lot of protection, protective type functions for the integumentary system, including the skin and uh, the hair and the nails. They all have some aspect dealing with protection. Sensation, there are sensory receptors uh, that uh, sense different things that can detect heat, cold, touch, pressure, and pain. All of these um, are located in the skin and can help detect these uh, different uh, senses. And then uh, number three is vitamin D production. You may not realize it, but your skin plays a very important role in the production of this vitamin. This is one of the few vitamins that your body can actually manufacture but it does require uh, a catalyst UV light, ultraviolet light from the sun, uh, and that helps a process, which we'll talk about a little later, helps a process in um, converting some precursor type molecules into the vitamin D that your body needs. And then uh, functions four and five are listed here for you. Temperature regulation is very important to regulate your body temperature. We talked about this briefly. Uh, your set point for your body temperature is around 98.6. And of course that fluctuates, fluctuates throughout the day, but uh, your skin plays an important role in trying to uh, regulate that body temperature. And then excretion, there's a, there's a small amount of waste that's actually excreted through the skin um, by means of the uh, uh, sweat glands. Um, there's very, it's a very small amount. Uh, most of the excretion that we'll talk about takes place, of course, um, based on the kidneys, but there has a little bit of, of, uh, of excretion taking place here in the skin. So these are uh, five of the main functions for the integument, integumentary system as a whole. Now, um, this slide just kind of shows you uh, a brief definition for each of those uh, layers of the skin. Remember, it's basically two layers, the epidermis, that is the most superficial layer and it's basically epithelial tissue. And so remember in chapter four, uh, you saw all the different types, the four major types of tissues. We'll talk about those briefly as we go through. And so uh, make sure you have a good understanding of the four main types of tissues in chapter four, because you'll see those in each of the chapters that we cover uh, throughout the course. Uh, the dermis is deep to that. It's basically connective tissue. It is a dense type of connective tissue. And um, then all of the dermis there is gonna sit or rest on the tissue just beneath it, known as the subcutaneous tissue, um, which is also a type of connective tissue as well. 
And uh, just uh, further note, like we talked about before, subcutaneous tissue is technically not part of the skin. And so what we'll do is kind of give a few uh, things about each of these uh, layers of the skin, a few more details here. And again, you have some diagrams. This is figure 5.2 um, that tries to illustrate um, the epidermis and the dermal layer. It shows you both on a, on a drawing, a diagram here, and using a microscope. This is enlarged only about 40 times. The LM there stands for light microscope. And so this has been enlarged just about 40 times, and this is what a cross-section of the skin would look like. Kind of shows you how, how uh, thick the epidermis is. All of this here would be epidermis, and then the uh, layer here is the dermis. What they don't show on the diagram uh, is the subcutaneous or the hypodermis. Now just a couple of uh, brief things about the epidermis. Uh, one of its functions is to help prevent water loss and it does uh, resist abrasion. So it has a protective function there as well. Uh, sometimes that epidermis is referred to as the cutaneous membrane. Anytime you see cutaneous, it really refers to the skin. That's a good word to uh, have in your vocabulary. And uh, it is, has different layers, distinct layers. There's usually four or five distinct layers. Those layers are called strata. And the outermost layer is going to contain keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. So here you have some of those uh, vocabulary words you should have uh, picked up in chapter four. And so here you have uh, stratified squamous. So you have multiple layers of relatively flat squamous shaped cells, epithelial cells, they are keratinized, so they have a uh, protein that kind of gives them a, a, uh, a hardened, uh, rigid type texture. Now that outermost layer, uh, each of those five layers is named, the outermost layer is named stratum corneum, and uh, again, it is basically squamous, uh, stratified squamous epithelial cells, has the keratin in there. These are dead cells on the outside. And um, that keratin is important because it gives those cells a, uh, uh, some strength to those cells. And again, that helps to uh, prevent water loss and also helps to um, hopefully protect the skin from, from injuries. Now the deepest uh, cell layer uh, is called the stratum basally. Um, and uh, that's where cells are uh, alive skin cells are alive, they're going through the process of mitosis or cell division, and that's creating new skin cells. And so as those new, skill, new skin cells form, then they start to push the older cells up and out, and then eventually that outer layer, stratum corneum, which are, again, those dead cells, eventually they will uh, basically shed off, flake off. Now, just a few uh, updates about, about the dermis. Remember, the dermis is connective tissue. It's not epithelial tissue, it's connective tissue. And it happens to be dense and collagenous. That word collagenous just means that it has a lot of collagen type fibers, a lot of collagen protein fibers that are there. And uh, that gives the, uh, the dermis kind of a dense um, uh, structure. You have different cell types that are found, found there. You have, for example, fibroblast, adipocytes, Macrophages, these are some examples of cell types that you would find in the dermis. Fibroblasts are basically cells that produce fiber. They produce collagen, they produce uh, proteins. Adipocytes, these are specialized cells that store, have the ability to, to, store, to store adipose or lipids or fats. And then macrophages, we'll talk about in a different chapter, in another chapter, are basically large white blood cells that help um, provide a little immune function for the skin. Also in the dermis, you'll find things like nerves and nerve endings, and receptors, and hair follicles. Uh, smooth muscle is there. You have a little bit of smooth muscle there in the dermis. Uh, you have uh, glands and also uh, lymphatic vessels um, that are part, partly found in the dermis as well. Then uh, towards the bottom of the um, uh, epi, uh, epidermis layer, but inside of the dermis, you have what are called the dermal papilla region. And I'll, I'll try to point that out on, a, on one of the diagrams, but it's at the upper portion of the dermis. It's uh, kind of a curved region, and uh, that is very close. It sits right next to 
the epidermis, that's where you're going to find a large amount of blood vessels. And it's those blood vessels that help to supply the epidermis with the blood supply that it needs. Remember, you have that layer, that stratum basally layer that contains uh, living cells. And those living cells have to have a blood supply. And so those blood vessels are located in that dermal papilla region. And so let's uh, back up a little bit. Let's look at the diagram one more time. Here's the diagram again. Here's an ep epidermis here. Notice it's kind of curved. The bottom of it is curved. You have a basement membrane that lines the epidermis going around. And then the uppermost portion of the dermis layer is what's known as the dermal papilla. It's that curved re region up here. And that's where you're going to find some blood vessels and nerves and things at that region. So whenever, so that allows for um, uh, gas exchange, nutrients, waste exchange uh, to take place for these epidermal cells that are right along the border here, because these are living cells. They're going to have to have oxygen and they're going to have to get rid of carbon dioxide. They have to have nutrients to survive. And so they get those things directly from the blood supply in that dermal papilla region. All right, in the next little section, we'll talk uh, briefly about what, what causes, what contributes to uh, skin color. Some of the factors here, there's, there's a couple of main factors, mainly pigments, but also uh, the blood that circulates through the, through the skin and also the thickness of the skin or the thickness of that outer layer, the stratum corneum. And so when we talk about pigments, we really main, mainly talk about two main ones. Really melanin plays, I think, the, um, the main role here. And so this uh, kind of determines skin, skin tone, skin color, and um, that's mainly for um, the pigments found in the skin, hair, and eye, in the eyes. And then also you have another pigment called carotene, and uh, you may uh, recognize the name of this pigment. It's kind of a yellowish, orangey type pigment. It's what gives us certain uh, vegetables like squash and carrots their uh, color, and uh, that also kind of contributes to your skin tone as well. Uh, melanin is uh, mainly a brownish to black pigment and, um, and again that's one of the primary ways that uh, that contributes or determines the skin color. It also gives you a little bit of UV light protection and so it's important to have the melanin production there because that helps to protect the body from UV radiation. And uh, the cells, there are specialized cells known as melanocytes the melanocytes here are cells that produce the uh, melanin pigment, and that goes into the uh, kind of in between the the cells of the skin cells, and it's put into little packages called vesicles, just like the storage vesicles we talked about in chapter three. Those storage vesicles are known as melanosomes, and so the the melanosomes they store the melanin, and uh, and there's a little picture to kind of show you about that process in a minute. Uh, let's take a look. Yeah, so figure 5.4, that's a good example. Here you have a, um, here's your basement membrane. This is at the bottom, kind of, if you look at the smaller diagram, this is at the bottom of the epidermis down here at the bottom layer here. This would be your dermis. And so you have that stratum basally. These are the dividing cells, the living cells of the epidermis. And occasionally you will find a melanocyte that's kind of scattered throughout some of these. And uh, uh, here's a melanocyte, and it's busy producing the melanin pigment. And uh, what it does is that melanin pigment is kind of packaged into little vesicles known as melanosomes. And then those melanosomes get absorbed by the surrounding epithelial cells of the epidermis. And so all this is taking place in the epidermis. And uh, the more melanin that gets produced, the, the, uh, the darker the, the skin layer will be. Uh, in addition to pigments, uh, skin color can also be determined uh, basically by blood flow. And so uh, if you've um, ever experienced uh, uh, um, a decrease in blood flow, or if you noticed, uh, you know, maybe if you're in a very cold environment, you notice your, your, uh, your nails or your, or your lips start to get kind of bluish color, you have decreased blood flow to those areas, you kind of see that bluish color. That bluish color is known as cyanosis. And so that's because of the decreased um, blood flow, the decreased hemoglobin going to those areas, and that can contribute to 
uh, skin color. And then in the reverse is true, if you have more blood flow going to an area, so this is kind of explains uh, whenever somebody blushes and they've got more blood flow going to their, to the, um, to the facial area and to the, to the superficial area of the face. Um, and that kind of creates a, a reddish tint in the person. All right. The um, last uh, part of the, of the diagram we'll let kind of take, take a look at here is the subcutaneous tissue. Remember, this is technically not part of the skin. The skin is also called the cutaneous membrane, and so this is subcutaneous. Make a, uh, take a look at the word. Remember that uh, the prefix here, sub, means below. So the word is actually telling you where it's located. It's below the cutaneous layer or below the skin. Um, it's also referred to as a hypodermis, which is also telling you that it's below the skin. Hypo means lower than, and dermis is referring to the dermal layer, so this is below or lower than the dermis. And its basic function is to attach the, uh, the skin, um, make that connection between what's underneath the subcutaneous, which is basically your bone and muscle layer. It does have, uh, it's made out of connective tissue, mainly loose connective tissue, and that also includes adipose tissue. So that's basically your main, one of your main topics for the chapter is the integument uh, as far as the skin goes. We also need to talk about some of those accessory structures, including your hair and your nails. And so uh, hair is pretty much found everywhere on the skin. There's different types of hair, um, but you're not going to find hair where you have thick skin, such as the palms of your, of your uh, hands and the soles of your feet. Uh, lips, nipple regions, uh, parts of the genitalia, and uh, usually the distal segments, the end segments of your fingers and toes are generally uh, do not have hair either. And uh, basically, uh, if again, you kind of can refer back to that diagram that we saw, there's a hair follicle. That's where the, the hair is, um, is uh, formed and grows and extends out from the hair follicle that's inside of the dermis, and it pushes out above uh, through the dermis into the epidermis. A couple of vocabulary words here. The shaft portion is any of the hair portion that's out on the surface of the skin. So if you see the hair on the outside of the skin, that's referred to as the shaft. Anything below the skin is referred to as the root. The one thing that helped you with this section of the chapter is basically to study the vocabulary. And so uh, there's not a lot of physiology here. It's just basically understanding the vocabulary words, find some way to help you um, be able to recognize these terms. I would suggest making some flashcards or making a separate vocabulary journal for each chapter so that you uh, have a good understanding of what these words mean. And so um, here's just a list of words. We'll kind of mention these briefly and I'll show you these on the diagram to try to help you out. Um, the outer layer of the hair is known as the cortex. The inner intersection is called the medulla. Uh, one thing to note is that these words are just general anatomical terms. In other words, we'll see these again used in other areas. Cortex just generally means the outer portion of the tissue or the organ, or in this case, the hair. Medulla just means the middle section, the middle portion. And so like I said, you'll see these terms used again. For example, the uh, adrenal gland has a cortex and a medulla section. Um, so there's many other places that we'll see the kidneys have a cortex and a medulla section. Um, but the cortex of the hair, the outside portion, has a covering called the cuticle, and that kind of creates a, uh, a protective layer on the outside. Uh, the hair is produced in the bulb, um, and that's located in the follicle. And then the hair papilla is the, uh, an extension of the dermis that protrudes into the hair bulb and contains blood vessels, it uses that same word that we saw back at the dermal papilla, and so it kind of has the same function except for the hair, and that's where some blood vessels are located there to supply the, de the growing hair cells with blood supply. Let me uh, look at the diagram first, and then we'll go back, back up a few minutes. Here's a nice diagram, figure 5.5. Take some time, look over the diagram. Uh, you can kind of see the cross-section again of the skin epidermis, dermis, hypodermis. You can see the hair follicle that's here. Talk about the shaft on the outside. The uh, root is below the surface. The cortex, the cuticle on the outside, and the medulla is in the middle. 
And then uh, right around this little area here, that's that hair papilla region. Notice they've drawn in like a little capillary there. And again, that capillary is there to supply blood supply to the developing cells, developing hair cells that are actively going through mitosis. Uh, this, um, the shaft portion and the, the shaft portion of the hair is dead cells but the living portion is down here in the root in the hair bulb, and that has the living portion of the hair cells, the growing portion, so those have to have access to uh, blood supply. All right, uh, as hair grows, it basically has a growth stage and a resting stage. So um, for uh, a particular hair area is gonna grow, uh, usually for a year to three years, it has a growing phase, and so it continues to, to grow, actively grow. And then, then uh, within, uh, after about three to five years, they'll go through a resting stage, and uh, growth will kind of cease for that particular hair follicle. Uh, when the growth stage resumes, that pushes out the old hair, and uh, that allows the new, new uh, hair to kind of take its place. And then uh, last couple of things about the hair. Hair color is determined again by the pigment melanin. Um, and uh, sometimes that pig pigment uh, begins to decrease as we get older. Uh, that pigment production decreases in the hair follicles. And then uh, any hair that uh, does not have the melanin pigment turns uh, kind of gray and white color. Then the uh, last structure here, the erectile, erector pili muscle. Remember what they said that there's some smooth muscle associated with the uh, dermal layer. And so this is actually a smooth muscle, erector, erector pili muscle, that attaches to the hair follicle. And when it contracts, that basically allows that um, hair to kind of stand up, uh, stand on end, like we say, and uh, kind of stand up there perpendicular to the skin surface. And that erector pili muscle is shown here also in the diagram. By the way, here is a gland, a, a, a oil gland sebaceous gland that's connected to that follicle as well. Which takes us to uh, talking about some glands. Um, we'll spend um, some time talking about glands, not just in this chapter, but some of the other chapters as well. Uh, these are exocrine glands. They're going to be secreting substances through a duct. And um, you have a couple of major glands here, sebace sebaceous glands. These are oil glands. They are connected by duct directly to the hair follicle where they secrete an oily substance known as sebum, uh, which is, uh, does have lipids in it that gives it its oily, oily texture. And that helps to, uh, to kind of moisturize and uh, lubricate the, the uh, hair and prevent um, the skin from drying out. It also seems to have a little antimicrobial function as well. Uh, sweat glands. Uh, also known as sudoriferous glands, uh, come in two different types. You have eccrine and apocrine sweat glands. So make, a flash cards on, make some flashcards on these to kind of help you understand the difference here, eccrine and apocrine sweat glands. The eccrine glands, um, these are the majority of your glands. They're pretty much everywhere, found everywhere in the body, uh, except for um, a few locations, but... Um, uh, they're pretty much everywhere. They're most numerous in the palms and the and the soles of your feet. And uh, this is where the majority of the sweat is produced, which uh, is mostly water, but there's a little bit of uh, salts and even a little bit of uh, urea that comes out of the sweat as well, but just a small amount. The uh, eccrine sweat glands, um, they do have ducts and they open onto the surface of the skin through pores, sweat pores, and of course that helps with um, balancing temperature, thermal regulation, and so as the body temperature goes up, your sweat glands are going to release some sweat to help hopefully cool you down a little bit. There's a, uh, another type of gland here known as an apocrine, apocrine sweat gland, and so uh, this is uh, mainly found in the uh, hair follicles um, associated with the armpits and the genital regions. And so these generally don't become active until puberty. And that's because they are influenced by uh, some of the sex hormones that are in the system. 
And so again, the diagram here kind of shows you um, uh, the same cross section of the skin that we've looked at, the epidermis, the dermis, and it shows you the sweat pores that would release the sweat onto the surface of the skin. Notice that the uh, sebaceous gland is associated right here with the hair follicle, so it's gonna secrete uh, the sebum directly um, through a small duct here uh, along the, uh, along the uh, root of that hair in the hair follicle. And then notice the uh, sweat gland here has a relatively long uh, duct that comes out to one of those pores. Another accessory structure for the integumentary system are the nails, the nails that cover uh, both the, uh, the fingernails and the toenails. This is basically a thin layer of uh, dead stratum corneum cells. Right? So you have dead skin cells that uh, are kind of thick and they have a large amount of that keratin type protein. Now again, there's a lot of terminology associated here and I'll kind of mention some of these things quickly, but go back and look at the diagram. I'll show you the figure in just a minute. Kind of outlines these different parts such as the nail body, that's the visible part that you see, but that's not the only part of the nails. There's actually nails below the skin, and so we'll look at that. Um, that's called the nail root. You also have the cuticle region, um, that's also referred to as the epinicium, and uh, that's part also of the stratum corneum layer, and that extends onto the nail body. And the nail root, and we'll take a look at that down to the nail matrix. The nail matrix is where the uh, nail is actively dividing and actively growing, is known as the nail matrix. And so uh, the nail matrix and bed are part of epithelial tissue. They're part of that stratum basally layer that's going through cell division, it's going through mitosis, and it's actually producing new uh, cells. Um, uh, one thing that you've probably noticed before is known as the lanula that is part of the nail matrix. Uh, you can actually see this if you take a look at your fingernails and uh, there at the kind of the base of the nail, the nail body, you see kind of a uh, cres crescent shaped white area. It's a relatively thicker portion of the, uh, of the nail body there. And so it's thick so you can't see the underlying blood vessels. So it has a white appearance. Um, associated with the nail at that point. So take a look here at the diagram. Figure 5.6 shows us a few things about the nails. And uh, here is the, again, the nail body. The whole surface of this is called the nail body. The root, the nail root is below the surface of the skin. The cuticle or the epinicium is this small little layer here, right up against the lanula area and the free edge. Both of these are wider because they're thicker and they have, um, and you can't really, they're not as transparent. So you can't really see through into the underlying surface. On the cross section, you kind of see how that um, nail body extends deep. This is where you're gonna find the nail matrix. These would have the cells that are going through cell division. These are the living cells. They're growing and they're pushing that nail outward like this. Now, uh, at the end of the chapter, it goes back and, and kind of reviews some of the protective functions for the integumentary system. Um, and so we'll kind of go through these uh, kind of quickly. Number one, reduction in body, body water loss. is very important to um, maintain homeostasis of fluids. There'll be another chapter that will talk about this, but the integumentary system helps your body um, um, maintain a correct water balance as well. Uh, number two, it acts as a barrier that hopefully will prevent microorganisms from penetrating and getting into the body. So your skin is what's known as the first line of defense that so actually is part of your immune system as well. Number three, it helps to protect underlying structures against abrasion. So it's a uh, protection, a physical type protection as well. Number four, we said that the uh, pigment melanin helps to um, helps absorb some of the UV radiation and that also is uh, very important to uh, protect the body. Five, hair, hair production. The hair on the head acts as a heat insulator. Eyebrows help to keep sweat out. Eyelashes help to protect the eyes. Hair in the nose and ears help to protect um, the entry of, of dust and maybe other some particles from getting into the nose and the ears. So hair has a function as well. 
and it's a again a protective function. And then of course the nails uh, at the fingers and toes also help to protect the fingers and the toes from damage. Your uh, skin also has sensory receptors and when we get to the nervous system we'll talk about different uh, sensory receptors located in the skin but these receptors can detect things like pain and heat, cold and pressure and um, there are sensory nerve endings that uh, kind of wrap around the hair follicle that help you uh, have a very sensitive touch and feel to um, movement of hair. Then uh, vitamin D we talked about briefly uh, as a function for the integumentary system. Vitamin D, I think I said before, is one of the few vitamins that your body can actually produce. And uh, it's kind of a complicated system. Um, we'll briefly go over a few points to it. Number one, it requires UV radiation, UV light, to act as a stimulus or a catalyst to uh, produce to start the production of vitamin D, it helps to produce a precursor molecule or a starting molecule that will go into the production of vitamin D. Uh, and that's located in the skin. So the, the light hits the skin, UV light hits the skin, that helps to produce the precursor molecule that goes into the bloodstream where it goes to your liver. Your liver plays a role in converting that into another molecule then that molecule then goes into the bloodstream as well where it makes its way to the kidneys and that's where you actually uh, formulate or convert that molecule into an active form that we call vitamin D. Now the reason you need vitamin D, which we'll talk about again in other chapters that is listed here for, for you for number four, vitamin D helps your body to hold on and to absorb or reabsorb calcium and phosphate um, those are uh, some very uh, needed minerals in the body. They do a lot of uh, important functions. And so uh, without the vitamin D, your body would excrete calcium and phosphate at a rapid pace through the small intestines. And so uh, vitamin D helps you to reabsorb these minerals. Your skin, your integument also helps to balance your temperature. We kind of mentioned that already. Helps to regulate uh, body temperature, um, or you can think of it as a homeostasis of body temperature. Um, of course, that's using the, uh, the sweat production that helps to cool you down. And also, you can uh, change how much blood flow is going to an area of the body. That also can, can cause you to either increase or decrease your body temperature. Yeah, this is uh, what this is kind of mentioning here, blood vessels and the dermis. Remember, we have blood vessels going into the dermis. They can either dilate, that, it, that allows them to open or to get larger, and that allows more blood flow to go um, closer to the body, uh, closer to the surface of the body, and that allows heat to be distributed or dissipate away from the body. If um, the body temperature starts to go down, then these same blood vessels can uh, constrict, and so that kind of keeps uh, more blood flow closer into the core of the body and that holds on to, um, to more heat. And that's kind of mentioned here on this slide. If body temperature begins to drop below normal, then heat can be conserved by constricting those blood vessels. So you have a little bit of temperature regulation here just in the uh, dermal layer of the skin as well. In the diagram 5.8, figure 5.8 kind of shows examples of, of heat exchange or or uh, regulation of body temperature. Here you have the dermis here, here you have some blood vessels, and they can either, uh, there's little um, muscles here, sphincter muscles that kind of wrap around these vessels, and so they can either dilate, and that allows more blood flow to get closer to the surface. If it's close to the surface, that means some of that heat can dissipate and can radiate off of the person and help cool the person down. If if you need to uh, conserve some of that heat, then these little muscles here can constrict and there's still blood flowing into this area. It just doesn't uh, lose heat as quickly. It helps to hold on to more of that heat and keep it more internal. Last couple things we'll look at, uh, excretion. Again, that's another uh, role of uh, function that we mentioned. It's a minor part of excretion, but uh, there is some waste products that can be released through sweat some water, some salts, and even a small amount of waste, metabolic waste products such as urea, uric acid, and ammonia. 
the uh, end of the chapter talks about a few other things we'll mention briefly here. It talks about burns, and so uh, because the skin is susceptible to damage, and so they do talk about uh, burns, first, second, and third degree burns, and so they outline these. First degree burn is a superficial type burn. It only affects the epidermis. It is red. It is painful. You may see some swelling present. That Note that word there, edema. That means swelling. Uh, you may see some swelling present because of that, and uh, usually there's no you know, no long lasting damage um, and it can heal relatively quickly within about a week or so. Second degree burns are definitely more serious and uh, they're referred to as partial thickness uh, burns and uh, because they can damage both the epidermal layer and the dermis layer. So they extend down into the dermal layer. And so um, uh, you may have symptoms such as redness, pain, swelling, and even blisters. It's going to take a little longer to heal. Usually, again, there's no scarring um, unless the burn goes deeper into the dermis. If it's, if it's a little more severe, it can go deeper into the dermis. You may uh, have some scarring and it may take longer to heal. Third degree burns are known as full thickness. Not only do you damage the uh, epidermis, but you also completely damage the dermis. And um, um, it sounds kind of strange, but usually these don't have as much pain associated with them that's because the actual nerve endings and the receptors actually get destroyed by the burn. And so that takes away the pain, uh, at least initially. And so there's usually some pain uh, that, that people experience later on as those nerve endings and nerves begin to uh, regenerate uh, in that area. This uh, diagram just kind of maps out. Here's our section of the skin. Figure 5.9 kind of maps out the, um, the distance um, penetration of each of, these, each of these types of burns. First degree, you know, kind of goes into the, uh, the epidermis, kind of stops pretty much at the epidermis. And then second degree goes down somewhere into the dermal layer. It may go all the way, but it, it may just go partially down into the dermis. And then full thickness goes pretty much the entire layer of the skin, even into the hypodermis. Then the last uh, topic that's covered here is skin cancer. Um, and uh, because it does affect the integumentary system and uh, it uh, is fairly common, you hear about um, individuals with uh, different types of skin cancer. So it's good to kind of be aware of these, uh, these types. It is the most common form of cancer and uh, mainly caused by uh, UV radiation. We said that, you know, the uh, melanonin, melanonin uh, pigment is there to kind of help prevent uh, damage. Well, um, it can only do so much. And so if you have extreme amounts of UV radiation, uh, then it can possibly uh, cause some type of mutation to occur in the DNA and that can lead to some type of skin cancer. Uh, generally, fair skinned people are a little more prone to damage. And of course, you can limit uh, and hopefully prevent skin cancers uh, by limiting your sun ex exposure, UV exposure, and um, definitely by using some sunscreens when you're when you go out in the sunlight. Um, there are different types of UV radiation. UVA rays uh, are less problematic. Usually they do cause a tan, but they are associated sometimes with malignant melanomas. UVB rays is what generally burns the skin more. Um, and so whenever you're buying a sunscreen or if you're buying glasses, sunglasses, make sure you're looking for um, uh, sunscreens that will block both of these UVA and UVB rays. There's three main types of uh, skin cancer. They're listed here for you. Basal cell, squamous cell, and malignant melanoma. Basal cell carcinoma. Um, these affect that stratum basally layer that we talked about. That's that lower level, the bottom layer of the epidermis. Those are the cells that are going through mitosis. And so um, they, if those uh, have cancer, it's referred to as basal cell carcinoma, that generally can be removed by some type of uh, surg surgical procedure. The squamous cell carcinoma, um, that's the relatively flat cells above the stratum basally layer, and uh, they can be problematic. They have a more tendency to uh, metastasize or move out into the bloodstream if they cross the uh, basal membrane there. And so uh, they can be definitely problematic, as can malignant melanoma, 
melanoma refers to the melanocytes. And so uh, those cells can um, grow abnormally and can also be uh, fatal as well. So it's very important to uh, take a look at the different types of, um, of skin cancers. And they're kind of shown here for you in that order that we just talked about, the, um, the basal cell, the squamous cell, and then the malignant melanoma in this diagram. 